Okay guys, we uh, have a couple of different uh, seedless vascular plants here. Have a pawpaw as well, angiosperm. But this one is um, Osmunda regalis. It's uh, called the royal fern. Um, and just like the other one that you see down here, um, it's dimorphic. So in the postings we had online, we showed uh, the main body of the fern called the frond. You think of it as kind of the leaf, it's the sporophyte. Um, and, and our sori and the spore producing structures, the sporangia, were on the back of that uh, frond. With these two species here, they are, they're what's called fac wet, meaning this is a wetland, it's a vernal wetland that floods a lot. Um, but they uh, live in reduced soils and we have vascularized tissues. So they have a rhizome underground that then gets those vascular tissues, excuse me, those uh, vascularized roots that pop off of that. And so the dominant phase for this plant is a diploid phase. And if we look at the little fiddlehead down here, as you guys can see this, but with our little fiddlehead right here, that unfurls, that's the result of fertilization taking place okay with the gametophyte producing the sperm and the egg and then the sporophyte comes up off that actually you get little rhizomes that grow underground and then these pop up off of it and that will become your um your actual fern now with the dimorphism what's going to happen is you'll have a photosynthetic frond here and a little later in the season you're going to get uh, the reproductive frond so we have a few of those for um woodwardia our virginia netted chain fern um, right here. This is from last season. So these are the uh, sporangia here, the actual uh, reproductive or sporulating. Now this is the asexual phase for reproduction. Um, so we get meiotic division in these structures that produces our spores that then when they go out disperse, ultimately they're going to germinate uh, and give us a gametophyte. And the gametophyte then has the antheridia, which produce the sperm, and the archegonia, which produce the eggs. And so when it rains then, uh, we get fertilization, the sperm can make it to the egg. And with that process then, that's one of the, you would think of it as kind of a shortfall with the seedless and the seed bearing vascularized plants insofar as they're tied to water for their reproduction. And that's gonna be the big thing when we get into our gymnosperms that we get the evolution of the pollen grain. And with that, we break from the need for water for reproduction and we can have an adaptive radiation out away from places where like this, you know, it's a vernal wetland where it's wet all the time or where uh, <clears throat> you have the need for water for that reproduction. It's a huge break uh, for them. And we actually have another species over here too. It's the, what is this one, Virginia? Oh no, Cinnamomia osmunda. So it's a cinnamon fern, kind of a cool one right here. And that's the reproductive stock from last season that came up. And then we have our native uh, bamboo here, over on Denaria, which is an angiosperm. So most everything we see out here um, they're angiosperms, angiosperms, angiosperms. In the next video, we'll go over the sporulating, the megaspores and microspores, what we call heterosporae, two different types of spores that we get in our, our gymnosperms. And the significant thing with the gymnosperms, again, the evolution of the pollen grain, the vascular tissue is huge for the ferns. And during the Carboniferous, I mean, some of these ferns, you know, with uh, the uh, lycophytes up to 120 feet tall, not what we have today here, um, but we will go over the gymnosperms the next time, talk about microsporangiate, megasporangiate cones, and the life cycle of our seed-bearing plants. And again, we're reproducing with spores here with all of our seedless plants, the seedless non-vascular bryophytes and the seedless vascular um, pteridophytes. When we get the evolution of the seed, um, that's a significant adaptive advantage for those organisms, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms take it a step further where we get what's called double fertilization. So you end up with a food source for that developing plant embryo. We also get co-evolutionary processes with seed dispersal agents and pollinators, and that's where the angiosperms really have an adaptive radiation um, and the speciation, like right now, about 600 species globally of gymnosperm, um, while the angiosperms, 300,000, 350,000, we have no idea. We're, we're, we're uh, you know, on a backlog trying to identify everything. Okay, take care. Get at you next.